That's Drew. That's Mike. And that's Josh Katz. What's going on, guys? How you doing today? Doing great. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. Josh is a photographer, photo educator, skateboarder, and YouTuber living in Brooklyn. Since 2006, he's accumulated over 66 million views and 375,000 subscribers. Whether it's by snapping boards, teaching beginners long exposure photography, or chowing down on another Nutella and bearing sandwich, Josh provides his audience with funny, athletic, artistic, and insightful content. Thanks for your time today, Josh. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. So let's start talking about how you got your start on YouTube. Your About You page on your personal website says you started at age nine and haven't stopped since. What was the start? Yeah, you know, it's uh, people think that I'm this calculated creator, and I suppose it's become that, that kind of game. But at first, it truly was just in the way that a kid would now make a Instagram. It was, it was the same thing. It's, I'm nine. I'm curious about the Internet and social media. And my dad showed me an article about YouTube in the newspaper, this new social media that had come out a few months ago. And I'm like, oh, this is this is rad, video creation sharing. And uh, at the time, I um, was just relatively new in skateboarding, about a year or two years in. And I got myself a camera and just started posting with no expectations, no plan, uh, just curiosity. I got two questions right off that. So you started skating at seven? Seven or eight, yeah. Wow, that, that's pretty awesome. And then so YouTube, at over the past 14 years, right? You've been doing YouTube for 14 years. How has it changed? YouTube has gone through so many cycles. And uh, yeah, it's wild. So old YouTube, I hate to be one of those like, ah, oh, back in the good old days kind of guys. But like, I really did love old YouTube in that... Um, before there was much monetary potential from being an online creator, um, it was just people who truly loved it um, and people who were creative and curious and um, just wanted to share something with the world. Um, and yeah, it was like you'd go onto youtube.com and on the homepage, every single video you'd see would be the coolest, most creative, insane video you'd ever seen and you'd just be completely mind blown. Um, <laughs> now, um, you know, I, I think the biggest shift that YouTube has gone is, you know, there is a ton of potential uh, financially from, from being on there. And, yeah. you know, I, I like might sound like I'm complaining about it, but also I've only benefited from this. So I'm not trying to, um, to whine, but I will say that, you know, the, the vlog revolution and the um, uh, inclusion of corporate sponsors and, and all, all this potential you know, the fact you can build a career doing this has drawn in a different type of person who makes videos. Like before it was um, creatives who had a camera and now it's people that want to be famous or um, people that want to vlog. And it was like before it was introverts who are really creative and now it's <laughs> extroverts who don't see anything wrong with vlogging every day of their life. Um, don't get me wrong. There is still fantastic co content being made on YouTube. But um, the average YouTuber uh, persona has certainly changed quite a bit. Do you still see the opportunity for, you know, young kids who are introverts to use this as the same kind of catalyst that you did to get out there and, and use it to be creative or, or will they be overtaken by the vloggers and the extroverts of the world? <clears throat> I mean, my advice to people who are thinking about starting any sort of social media game is just get it going. Um, I think that the best way you're going to have any success doing social media is if you're not trying to do it to have, be successful. A lot of people tell me they want to get on there uh, so they can make some money because it sounds so easy. And I'm like, all right, cool. Well, you're going to do it for two months, not find any results. And because you were motivated by the wrong things in the first place, you're going to be tired of it and it's not going to happen. My advice to folks is if you have a genuine creative itch that needs to be scratched, get it going. See what happens. Um, but if, if you're not truly self-sustainingly interested in it, um, it, it it's not really going to go anywhere. Yeah, we, we, we want to resonate that 100%. And I think one of the things for Drew and I is like, just get out there, get started, right? And that's, that's kind of why we wanted to get the podcast out, because there's so many YouTubers who have resonated the same thing that we've talked to, the same thing. I just started, and maybe it pivoted, but you just got to do something, right? So... Yeah, and I like how you emphasize a lot on focusing on the content and the process of making that content. 
Um, going back to your first skate video, what was the process of making that first skate video? It was, I believe, called My First Skate Video. I know you talked about, you said your dad got you a camera. Who uh, else was involved in helping you start the channel when you first started it? Well, the, the, uh, there were, uh, fortunately, a few older videos that got taken down. Um, <laughs> my, my young self lacks the hindsight that I, I wish I had. Um, the first video I ever made was I had a horrific like Logitech, um, what's it called? A, uh, webcam. Can I start? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you guys mind if I start this over? Yeah, go yeah, for it. Yeah, we're, um, so first video I ever made, which actually got taken down, uh, because I, I lacked hindsight as a kid, but first video was, I had this horrific Logitech, um, webcam on my computer. And I, I turned my my desktop computer facing out the window, and then ran outside uh, <laughs> on the sidewalk and did a, a pressure flip or like a skateboarding trick. And um, that was my first video. And the colors were so wacky; it was like green toned, um, like it was completely green. It looks yeah. like uh, America Made, if if you guys are familiar. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, that was that, and then you know, just again, just with the friends eventually having a real camcorder and casually making things, editing it up in Windows Movie Maker and, and tossing it online. Very casual process that took like, you know, 20 minute edits and stuff, but uh, <laughs> it definitely wasn't about the production at that point. Yeah. It was, it w was your whole channel then still skateboard focused because that was your creative outlet? So for the first upwards of, four or five years, I did not say a word to the camera on my YouTube channel. And I built quite an audience as just a truly silent skateboarder. Um, but it was, it was a, it was an obsession. You know, I'd post two videos a day. I'd go skate, I'd film, I'd make an edit, I'd post it and I'd be like, yeah, I can go skate again. <laughs> um, and you know, of course, eventually there was the introduction of personality and comedy and, and just sort of pushing the barriers a little bit. And why was that? Why did that change happen? What was the? It was, I, mean, I guess, maybe a little bit of maturity from being nine to at that point thirteen, or where did that come from? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's sort of a matter of um, experimentation and curiosity, and just looking for to do something different. Like, I remember, I think the first video I ever talked, I tried. My brother was also a large YouTuber back in the day, and he made a bunch of comedy videos. So I just tried to do a comedy video and. I'm so glad that that doesn't exist now. <laughs> it's a strange thing. But um, I remember, like, at one point, I, I made a, a Day in the Life video, which um, this was, uh, let's see, about eight years ago now. And okay. at the time, vlogging was a dirty, sinful word on YouTube. Like, if you told people you were vlogging, they'd be like, who are you? This is horrible. We hate vloggers. Um but if you said day in the life, it was like this weird, like, oh, okay, he's just kind of like letting you into his day. Um, it was vlogging. And it was like the very forefront. I mean, there were definitely people that were doing it beforehand, but like it was the forefront of the daily vlogger. Um, and back when people didn't obsess over vlogs. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it was just realizing that people absolutely craved the personality. And um, it was more about you as a person than, than and, I mean, I, I think that being a good creator is a balance between marketing yourself as a uh, personality uh, and hopefully the creative process of whatever you make, whether it be your, your sport or your talent or whatever it might be. Hopefully, it's, it's a nice balance for me, too. Sometimes it leans more into uh, one or the other, though. Yeah, very cool. I, as I'm listening to you talk about that now and as we're talking about sort of the progression of YouTube from when you began to now... I was thinking back to one of your videos is from 2013 and it was called how to get big on YouTube. And so I'm going to read the four suggestions or three or four recommendations that you had in that video and see what still holds true in your mind and what might be a little different. If, if you don't mind me oh, talking man. for the next couple of minutes, I don't even remember what I said in that. So that sounds fun to me. It's, it's very consistent with what you're saying now, which is pretty cool. But the first thing you recommended was staying consistent in your content. So you said like if you were if you're gonna do skateboarding videos, stick to skateboarding. Don't branch out to a, a thousand different ideas at one time. Second was watching your progression over time. 
watching how you progress as a skateboarder, watching how you progress as a YouTuber, in this case, going from being a silent YouTuber to giving more of your personality, I guess. And in that point, you also talked about engaging with the people that you film, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, third recommendation, something you seem to just talk about too, which was titling things appropriately. And that was sort of touching on your advertising of day in the life versus vlogging. At the time, vlogging was sort of a taboo word, but if you advertised it, titled it a day in the life, it might get a different response. That's how I interpret it, at least. And then the last recommendation you had was don't underestimate the power of comments and using user suggestions and comments to sort of guide your content in the future, too. Yeah, I don't hate what 14-year-old me had to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, that's in general pretty good. I, I'd say like one of the craziest paradigm shifts I've seen in the creator over the last few years has been... Um, you now have folks that don't really have a product they want to market besides themselves and how that has become oddly viable for some people. I'm not yeah. crazy about it, but it's definitely been a pathway for some folks. It's interesting how, yeah, the 21st century has sort of opened this possibility that you can make a living out of an ego in a sense on social well, media. I, I still think that could be in the past. I mean, look at like True. celebrity. True celebrity hasn't changed it's just opened up a new medium it's now you're not a tv star you're a youtuber and then to become like a, a whole repertoire but i do believe that the vlogging has introduced the the person into people's lives a lot more than just the celebrity advertised on the i don't know tabloid something like that you actually get into their life Yes, but I'd also add that uh, you know, celebrities tend to be at least something at the core as they're great actors or they're great artists or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Whereas as a creator, like with, with camera gear getting so easy to manage and editing being effortless, like you have folks that aren't even into filmmaking at, as creators. It's truly just personal marketing. And like, you know, if, if they are resonating with someone and making uh, entertaining content, all the better for them. But um yeah, it, it's a crazy thing. And I will say that the paradigm shift that has pushed my channel in the direction outside of skateboarding and into photography was kind of a frustration with this. Um, I felt like the skateboarding space had been saturated and was getting boring and um, was getting to be, um, yeah, I felt like I couldn't really, really innovate in there anymore. And I, I just wanted to do something a little bit more challenging, something... Um, Something that I could really add, add to the um, to the ether with, I'd say. Yeah, that um, makes sense. And on top of all of that, I wanted to depersonalize the channel. So in the realm of like being the celebrity, um, yeah, I knew that it, it was a lot about marketing your own personality, and people were desperate for more and more and more. Like if you, um, they want to see one of the craziest subgenres on YouTube. If you guys want to see some cringe content, is <laughs> girlfriend reveal videos. Have you guys ever, ever, ever seen this before? No, uh, I'm quite curious. Going down the path. No. So like, you know, people, when you have a channel that is based on your personality, people want as much of it as possible and they're going to push for everything that, that you're willing to give. So like, if you want to talk about your romantic life, my God, they'd love to know. And like, <laughs> you know, and, and as a result, you put girlfriend in the title and like, boom, that's a hit. Girlfriend reveal. Uh, which, oh my God, it's horrible. That's exactly what it sounds like. It's it's horrible. But those videos <laughs> do pretty well for a lot of folks. And um, yeah, I just like, uh, it, it felt like a very strange thing to be giving more and more and more. And I, it's a hard thing to, like once you share something, it, it's really tough to walk back. So I, um, yeah. yeah, I felt like I wanted to figure out a way to be on the internet in a way that was able to maintain a private life and not have to sell my personality, not have to sell my, my friendships and um, what I truly enjoy, just have that be a pure thing. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not totally like, uh, I'm still an influencer that loves to document everything and, and now it's just photos versus vlogs, but like, um, yeah, it's definitely been really nice to step back and like date a girl without showing her on my YouTube channel, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. But you did, you, yeah, you did have a few videos yourself that did end up being very successful. You have uh, four videos at the moment with over a million views. 
Two of them are board snap compilations, I believe. One is your 17 stair hard flip attempts, and one is the long exposure photography tutorial. Do you remember which one hit a million first and what it was like watching it hit a million? Uh, was it the uh, 17 stair board snapping? Is that it? I think that was the oldest one. I'm not sure if they like you know if they hit a million in the same yeah. time that you uploaded them. Um, yeah, I mean the 17 stair board snapping one was a really funny thing because that's not even my video. Uh, that was I, I another successful YouTube channel. I saw that trick happening and those attempts. I'm like, oh, that's wonderful. And this is during a time in which everyone's reposting each other's videos in promotion. So like I'm like, oh hey, send me your best stuff. Make sure to include those 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 attempts. And um, of course, that became the thumbnail and the title. And I had a little promo in the end where I'm talking about how great they are and sending people their way. And then, of course, the video goes viral. So at a time, I think my <laughs> most viral video was a video that I had pretty much nothing to do with, except for scouting out the potential, which is kind of bizarre. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, um, it, it's it's crazy when the photo tutorial, which was the most recent one, hit a million, hit a million. I felt like a pretty cool milestone, and uh, it's really fulfilling and exciting to know that like I have taught that many folks how to take a long exposure photo and that like uh, the other reason why I, I pushed into photography was like I knew that I could do a difference in my teaching style um, and I knew that um, the feeling that I get knowing that these many people are benefiting from it and like finding you know uh, fulfilling hobbies professions like uh, just artistic pursuits and, and forms of expression is like the most fulfilling I've ever felt making content for the internet. And how do, how do your fans interact with you? So you've taught over a million people how to do those, that style of photography. How have you interacted with them? Have you seen, Hey, look at this picture, Josh, I just took, I know you have a, a hashtag to get back to you. Um, is that the main way? Yeah, I mean, it's a bunch of things. Uh, so there's definitely the hashtag that I, I encourage people to use, Josh Katz Photography on Instagram, which is a nice thing that I like to look on every once in a while and just see what everyone's up to. I've uh, got a lot of people just regularly using that. Uh, on top of that, there's definitely um, just DMs. I love DM culture. I encourage everyone to DM me. I say, like, look, feel free to watch this video and ignore me, but uh, the reason why I do this is to make you a better photographer. So if you want to show me those results, uh, that's how it becomes fulfilling for me. Uh, so uh, yeah, I got a lot of people DMing me their work, and it's always really sweet to see um, people progressing, people telling me their stories of, of personal successes they've had in their career thanks to my my videos. And like, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's wonderful. Now, one question there about Instagram. So it seems that most photographers are using that as the medium to meet customers and to put their work out there but since you're working from the educational side does it make more is that why you're choosing the medium of youtube or solely based on the background that you have with the youtube culture um i mean i think you have to acknowledge every social media for its strengths and weaknesses you know like uh if you want to have a sexy portfolio then you better have one on instagram and mm -hmm. uh if if you want to actually make engaging photo content which is what makes me stand out. There are so many photographers who are better than me, but um, there aren't as many who can make an engaging video and be shooting good photos at the same time. You know, that's a that's a the weird little niche that I've carved out in the photo space, as well as just a straight up photo tutorial. Um, yeah, it's definitely a different uh, approach uh, from other photographers, and uh, the two go hand in hand. But there's no social media that's going to be self-sustainingly uh, perfect for for your art form if you're if you're doing a bunch of different things. Right. Yeah, I think that that is 100% correct. Now, one thing that we we did jump past, and I think is, is a huge part of who you are, is the people who go to your channel now see you as the photographer and the educator, but they don't realize that you were a like, sponsored skateboarder, which is a very difficult thing to do in no, er no different from any era, even if it was like the... The, you know, the tape VCR, having to mail that out to someone, or <laughs> the day where you're creating a YouTube channel and then getting sponsored. How did you go down the path to become a sponsored skateboarder? And was, was that through YouTube, or how did you get involved with Revenge, Revive? Yeah, so uh, back in almost 10 years ago now, uh, I don't even, I guess it was 2000 and, 
10 ish. Uh, okay. Andy Schrock, who was a good friend of mine uh, through the internet, um, decided to start a skateboard company based on his crew and um, and you know the audience that he was building on YouTube. And he asked me to be one of the um, original team members. Uh, at the time, it, it was a funny thing because you know every kid that rides a skateboard wants to be sponsored. I also was not that good. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, the brilliant model that Revive went down was um, a company that it was really the first skate company to ever appeal to kids. Um, a bunch of skate companies in the past kind of dabbled with it uh, as like a side program, but then you look at their main team riders and their um, public personas and, and personalities and brands are behind doing drugs and uh, partying and and it's I mean cool and all, but it, it doesn't relate to the eight year old that's first getting into right. skateboarding. So yeah, Revive pretty much just cornered that market and has done a wonderful job with that. And also Progress is a legitimate company that I think respectable skateboarders can get behind. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it definitely started out as sort of a, uh, a YouTuber-based company and, and still is very internet-focused. But I also I take the role of being a sponsored skateboarder kind of seriously. And I work way too hard and I try way too hard. Uh, I, I shouldn't be trying as hard as I do, actually. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, you know, it's it's my my biggest passion in life is skateboarding, and uh, I wanna I wanna still represent the company to the best of my ability. So actually, I just got back from a skate trip to Boston um, late last night, and uh, you know, I can barely walk right now, but it feels good because it was mad productive. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, that's very cool. Did you go with the Revive team? I didn't. I actually have a little crew that I've been uh, doing missions with in New York now. Oh, awesome! Awesome, and and I'm sure you're shooting for your own part then. Or just for fun? We're actually producing a, a local video that we're working on right now. I've already finished my revive part uh, that'll okay. drop next year, I believe. Um, so I'm just working on another project now. Wow, that's awesome. And and it, I sorry, Drew, but uh, yeah. I did hear you say in one of your videos that you you've transitioned your channel, but it actually has brought a different kind of love and respect back to skateboarding for you. Do you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that for the, our listeners? Yeah, so you know, there's this whole mentality behind uh, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Uh, on the flip side, there is the if you try to uh, merchandise and, and um, profit off of your passions, then mm -hmm. the passions can become uh, yeah, they become more of a job. Yeah. yeah, and uh, how do you how do you strike that perfect balance between you know loving what you do and keeping some things whole? And like, yeah, as a skateboarder, I was just frustrated, and it felt like every time I skated, I needed to make a video. I wasn't inspired to make videos, and it was just um, yeah, it was burdening this great passion of mine. Uh, and I, I, I yeah, so when I stopped making skate videos called Turkey, well, I was easing out for a while, then I went cold turkey. Um, it was awesome. I, skateboarding became this wholesome thing again where I just did it for the love and uh filming for these full-length videos that we premiere I mean that is its own it's it's very like it's just truly around the the um skateboarding progression there's no vlogging there's no talking to the camera it's truly just I'm gonna do the hardest trick I could possibly do right now and that that to me has never felt like uh work in the same kind of way that making a YouTube video did it's just it's what I do um and yeah I've never had a more healthy progress oriented relationship with skateboarding than now um so yeah i'm really happy that i made that change and i think that i've also i've taken that mentality into the photo space and knowing that like no matter yes it would be uh savvy for me to make a video every single time i take photos i should never have a i should always have a 360 camera mounted on my screen <laughs> for every time i click the shutter button but uh in reality that's how you taint your hobbies. Um, and I, I want to, I've been very conscientious about putting up barriers to be able to enjoy what I do uh, still wholeheart wholeheartedly, uh, not trying to capitalize off of it. So, like, I still go and shoot street just for fun. And I still take plenty of photos that will never get seen or never get, you know, the process won't be documented. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so, like, when I'm making a YouTube video, I'm making a YouTube video. And um, when I'm just shooting, I'm just shooting. And sometimes the two overlap. Sometimes I'll use photos that I shot for fun in a video. But uh, by 
creating a barrier there. It's, it's kept photography still healthy and exciting for me. Yeah, that's really cool. I wanted to ask about within the realm of skateboarding, and I'm thinking back to some interviews that we've done before with athletes. They have ranged in their training programs or their nutrition programs from very regimented and very thought out, detail to detail, to like, no, the only training I do for mountain biking is just mountain biking more. And I'm sort of wondering where you might fall on that range in terms of your training, if you focus on anything with nutrition, anything like that. When you're not able to skate, how are you preparing to skate? How are you keeping that motivation and that passion for skating? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not that great of an athlete, so I'm probably not the right guy to ask this question to. Uh, but, uh, you know, just eating healthy, doing yoga, stretching, stuff like that. Nothing yeah, too serious. Absolutely. I, I'm a big advocate for stretching and practicing yoga. I think that's, that's helped me a lot in my athletic pursuits for sure. Yeah. I mean, look, I like, well, I am technically a sponsored skateboarder and I do take myself too seriously. There doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You know, it's just a fun thing that I do that happens to have happened. Um, sorry, it matters that I'm sponsored and it's a big honor, but like, um, the, the, degree of skateboarding excellence that I achieved there there isn't the only uh demand for progress is is my own personal demand it's not uh you know I, I don't have revive is really chill I will say yeah yeah <laughs> I'm thinking well, I mean, back now to you happen to be really good at it too so like let's not let's not hinder the fact that you're a very 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 good skateboarder oh I appreciate that guys yeah and that that sort of mood, that chill mood, reminded me of a video you posted that I watched about giving your thoughts on longboard scooters and ripsticks, and what the different riders of those are. And you had a great approach to just say, you know, appreciate each one for what it is, welcome welcome each person for what it is. Saying that rollerblading is easier than skateboarding is not really the right thing to do, but saying, well, hitting that trick on rollerblades might be easier than hitting it on skateboard. That's that's more in depth. That's more appreciating the sport. That was in 2013. I was curious, since then, there have been some innovations like electric long boards as one-wheel boards. What's your thoughts on those? Um, I mean, though, look, I think that anything that can be done as a um, form of creative expression and, like, has a, a great uh, progress, like, a, if, if you can progress on it and do cool things and, and, and express yourself with it, then that's awesome. But... The one wheelers are just transportation, you know. Like, there's not much you can do besides yeah. ride on it. Um, if someone figures out a, figures out a way to kickflip a one board, like, all right, that's cool. <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is, you know, electric long boards, uh, one wheelers, those are transportation devices without much uh, utility in terms of creative expression. And um, also, we have to we have to acknowledge who the typical riders of each of these are. Um, yeah, it tends to be, you know, corporate dad likes to think he's still young. <laughs> um, they get a bad rep, but anything can be done in a cool manner. So some things tend to not be very cool <laughs> <laughs> by nature of circumstances <laughs> and price point. Yeah, and crazy. I've seen some crazy commuters on those things, man. I don't know how they put themselves out in traffic on those things. Well, imagine That's, being in New York old. City. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm thinking, I've seen people riding around on on one wheels and electric longboards through Cincinnati, and I think they're crazy. But I can't imagine. Do you see a lot of that in New York City? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I like. I was in the Prospect Park yesterday, and, or two, a few days ago, and I, I saw this dude, classic one wheeler, full pads, um, just this like 30 year old tech bro, uh, and he's talking to his friend who's walking next to him, which is just a really awkward sight. <laughs> as he's one wheeling and he's like yeah it's great you got an app and you can see uh where all the millennial hotspots are because those are the guys with the one wheels in the city i'm like <laughs> wow all right you're just being a, a meme of yourself now Come on. <laughs> have you seen the 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 one that looks like a big wheel and then it kind of it kind of it, it looks like a unicycle with the feet yeah, on it yeah. those things rip. That one is, yeah <laughs> the, I, I, there's a guy when i run in our in the in allentown here there's a guy who rides it on the trail, I guess, to his office or something. But he is flying through that thing. It looks terrifying. It does. It really does. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm also curious about the background behind your eight surprising uses for a penny board video. I referenced that in the little introduction with you eating a Nutella and skateboard bearing sandwich. But 
how'd you get connected with Pennyboard? What was the background for you making that video? All right, it's that was funny. that was. There's a funny story behind that one. So, that was a sponsored video by Pennyboard. Um, and when they hit me up, wanted to do something. They wanted an unboxing video. They wanted me to just every brand that's ever gonna hit you up is like, just make an unboxing video. Just show okay. off the product and say why it's great. And I'm like, yeah, no, that's not how I do things. Um, how about we make a skit acknowledging all of the flaws and and brand perceptions <laughs> that your company currently has about you know, penny boards are for for kooks and for. Um, Actually, can we cut that out? I don't want to say kooks. Um, how yeah. about we make cool? How about we make a video acknowledging all of the flaws that your product has? You know, penny boards being for uh, kind of wackier people that don't actually skate, uh, being impossible to do tricks on, so on and so forth. Um, because if I had made a video just straight up endorsing penny boards, my core skateboarding audience would would grill me. Um, so in the <laughs> end, I, I struck this really hysterical balance, in my opinion, of like. Um, People didn't realize that it was an ad. <laughs> they uh, they thought I was making fun of Pennyboard. Pennyboard had a good sense of humor about it and felt that it was a good subtle ad. And in the end, um, yeah, it, it, it did very well as a result. So that, that was a cool thing. Yeah, I went into watching it thinking it was going to be sort of a spoof video making fun of them, but it gave me a good opinion of it. It was it was a great advertisement for them. It was very funny. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I think that it was cool they were will, willing to acknowledge uh, exactly their spoofable abilities on, on the product. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly right. So I definitely want to start talking with you about some photography. And maybe we can just start with how you got into photography. Did that come as a result of your filmmaking with YouTube? Or was that something sort of that branched out separately from that? Yeah, you know, uh, always have cameras around with the YouTube stuff, but uh, when I smashed my face as a 15-year-old skateboarder uh, and had to get some root canals and couldn't skate while all that was happening, uh, it just became this natural pivot into like, all right, can't skate, what do I do now? All my friends skate. My life is skateboarding. I still <laughs> want to be around skateboarding. Let's take skate photos. Um, and, you know, it started off as just... Uh, taking the actual action shots, and then I started capturing like in between kind of documentary style moments, and then capturing uh, strange things happening around the skateboarders that had nothing to do with skateboarding, and it became street photography, and it just kind of uh, expanded out from there and, and became this deep passion of mine. One of your videos that you posted in October of last year, this past fall, was you using a disposable camera, and I really liked watching that video. Maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience with the disposable cameras and then if you shoot any more film outside of disposable cameras. Yeah, so the disposable cameras are really fun. You know, they're, they're easy. It's, it's a different type of shooting. You know, like you can pass it around at a party and get some of the best shots you'll ever find. Um, and, you know, I think that every, every camera is its own tool that can be um, excellent if you acknowledge its strengths and weaknesses. So if you want a, a, a larger resolution, uh, precise photo, you're not going to use a, a disposable. But if you want something that's fun, easy, lightweight, and that you don't mind, like you get one of those waterproof ones that go swimming with it. Like, oh yeah, it's, it's wonderful, and it, you're going to take it to places you wouldn't normally take a camera and get shots you wouldn't normally get. So that's that's rad. Um, and yeah, you know, film photography is rad. I've I've got the utmost respect for it. I will say that as a as a creator and as a photographer, like my kind of perspective lately has been. I don't really care about what type of camera that I use. It's more about getting the actual photo. So like, I'm like not as eager to experiment with um, with different types of cameras just because like my camera is, is satisfying my, my needs right now. I just want to focus on the moments. But that's that's a mentality I'm going to deepen right now. And sometimes I'm all about experimentation with different cameras and, and you know, um, I will say that uh, there is an interesting fetishization of camera experimentation that can detract from um, pursuit of creative excellence, um, which has to be acknowledged. Uh, there are definitely you know, creators out there that um, don't take good photos, but they use interesting cameras. And uh, <laughs> that is its own niche appeal. I would hope to always be somewhere in the middle, you know, always just holding down the photography realm 
um, no matter what type of camera I'm using. Do you do you shoot mostly on digital platforms? Do you have any film cameras? Yeah, I mean, I, I always mess around with Polaroid, and I have a, a few film cameras, but mostly I'm like 95% digital. What are you shooting with today? I'm using a Canon 6D Mark II, but I'm very excited for the new Canon mirrorless cameras to drop. The R5, R6 might be a... Uh, might be the, the, the jump of the mirrorless I've been waiting for. Okay. Cool. I what so as a as a novice to not understanding, what would be the advantage to going to a mirrorless camera for you? Yeah, so the mirrorless cameras tend to be a little bit smaller, a little bit more powerful. Eye autofocus is one of those things. Just the, the autofocus capabilities on the mirrorless cameras tends to be uh, much, much better. So yeah, that's really exciting, and uh, I'm I'm stoked that Canon has made the jump into mirrorless in the last few years, and is um, it's going to put out one of the most competitive, game-changing mirrorless cameras in the market. Uh, it seems like very very soon. And it seems like your photography has even started moving to obviously it's been moving to the point where you're actually educating and and sharing that passion with other people. How did you get into wanting to? not just create your own content, but share those technical skills and those creation techniques with other people? What made you want to become an educator in that sense? Yeah, I mean, it started with photo education. Like the first video I made was was just a photography tutorial on YouTube, uh, or the first photo video I made. And uh, yeah, it was just sort of a, hey, I can do this. I think a lot of you guys have been asking to see how I do this. Why not share some knowledge? And um, you know, there's one thing I've learned from from doing education, photo, and skateboarding, and it's that sometimes an intermediate photographer can teach better than an advanced photographer. And same goes for skateboarding. Um, skateboarding tutorials from pro skaters are always comically bad. They're always like, yeah, so we're going to learn how to do McTwist. Just uh, put your foot here, put here, and then spin 540 degrees. <laughs> like, it's it's like they, they've gotten so good that they've become out of touch with it. Um the photo space, I think, is a little bit better because you do have a lot of career educators who are also professional photographers. But, uh, you know, the better you get, the more out of touch you are with what it's like to be a beginner working with a beginner setup. And, uh, you know, when I was still when I was starting out, I was still using some some pretty novice gear. And um, I was I was definitely still like in the trenches of, of teaching myself, which um, I think made for a more relatable um also millennial style approach to, to photo education that I've always tried to try to incorporate that I think is differentiated in my channel. So if, if you were to make, make a suggestion to a novice um, today, hey, you, you have been shooting on your iPhone because I know you've done some video style like that and you've talked about that. Now, if you were to go out and buy a camera at a either a big box store, I would suggest going to a local camera store, but... Um, what would what would you suggest them to get as a starter? You know, what what's the entry point and what does that typically cost? And what what tools do they need? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what type of photos that they want to shoot. You could buy a film camera, you could buy a little mirrorless camera, you could buy a point and shoot. Um, yeah, I, I'd say what's your price point and uh, what kind of shots do you want and what are your uh, what are your hard parameters? Do you need a tiny camera? Do you need a spy camera? Like, <laughs> yeah. I you needed to fit wrong. inside the tip of a pen. Um, yeah, it's a it's a huge rabbit hole to go down, and I definitely I think I fell into that sort of stereotype you were talking about before, where the person is getting more concerned with the cameras they're taking pictures with than the, than the actual photos they're taking. But that's sort of my mentality. I like you know as a kid, I liked taking apart my toys and seeing how they worked. I like I like understanding how machines function. So. Old cameras to me are very fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I will say, even as a guy that pushes digital and, and feels that it complements his his medium and, and creative process best, it's such a special thing to shoot film. And I think every photographer should, should try it. Uh, oh, yeah. Because it, to understand truly what the creation of a photo once was and still can be, um, it, it gives you a deeper appreciation for, you know, not taking an image, but making an image. And um, yeah, printing in a dark room is a magical experience. Yeah, and it's it's really cool how it, even the word camera itself is related to like the word chamber. You know, originally a camera was just this big empty room with a tiny hole in one end that would project an image onto the other wall. And it's it's developed into this. It's pretty cool. 
progression. I was also talking with Mike earlier today, and I'm just I'm very biased towards film. I think film is very cool. But we were talking about um, just comparing like the resolution quality, and I was telling him, you know, you can get into really high quality photos for a pretty low admission price with film cameras. And I was reading, I'm going to read off of KenRockwell.com right now. Good man. <laughs> but he says, uh, with 35 millimeter film, for example, it would basically be the equivalent in terms of rev- resolution of a 175 megapixel digital camera. And then you can go beyond that. You can get into like 120 film relatively cheap. You can get a twin lens reflex camera and those those square images are giving you the resolution of like a 313 megapixel digital camera. And I, I think that's so cool. Yeah, no, I mean, film camera still 35 millimeter is a golden standard of resolution. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's funny seeing how long it's taken for the digital progression to catch up to that point. Um, and now we're coming out with, you know, 50 megapixel cameras that are relatively affordable. Um, <clears throat> Which is huge, and you know, it's it's finally just starting to surpass the film, the the, the film world uh, in terms of resolution or or match it. But yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I always got to factor in the accessibility of printing and uh, buying film, medium format film photography, of course, being a really expensive hobby to have on the back end. Maybe oh, less yeah. the front end. Yeah, and that's that's the difference with my situation for sure. Is I do it just purely as a hobby i'm not i'm not publishing my content or anything like that like you are it's it's a totally different approach to it but yeah it's cool it's cool to hear different perspectives on it you can't Um, find those little uh, drive up uh canister looking buildings that you could drop (laughs) film off and show up 24 hours later to get it now they're all like little drive up coffee shops but i love the one in orlando that that colonial photo and hobby is a great place so, um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, uh, Drew, all you. Yeah, what was I going to ask next? Oh, yeah, tell me about some of your best-selling prints. I know you sell prints on your personal website. I looked through some of them. I've been to some of those places, too. Like, I like the Burano print a whole lot. Oh, yeah, you know, I've got mixed feelings on even having prints for sale these days. Yeah, it's just yeah. Kind of one of those things I do. And, like, people like the landscapes because they, they sit well in someone's house. But I also don't like to think of myself as a landscape photographer and kind of feel like I've progressed beyond the point of the a lot of the photos that I'm selling right now. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, I, I just think that it's really cool to offer affordable artwork to my audience. And, um, you know, uh, I think that I've tried to – I think of a lot of my, my photography creation uh, as prioritizing accessibility. Um, you know, the classic fine art photographer is like out of touch on social media and, you know, thousand dollar prints and such. And I'm like, you know what? Like, screw it. Like, I, I'm not a fine art photographer. Like, I, <laughs> I, I appreciate my craft and I, I try my, my, my best and all. But like, let's just uh, make it available to the masses. And if someone respects my work and wants to support me and have a print of, of one of my shots in their room, then like, you're going to get that for a very reasonable price, and that's that's okay with me. It's um, Yeah, it's a fun little thing to do. It's yeah, and it seems, good. That, it okay. seems that mindset has been leading to success for you because recently you were named the Explorer-in-Chief, right, of the Downtown Alliance in Lower Manhattan? Did yeah. Did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Uh, yeah, so I got this gig that is um, basically like a three-month creative residency in Lower Manhattan for – the Downtown Alliance, which is the business improvement district uh, group that, that in a weird way kind of runs Lower Manhattan. Um, yeah, I'm very excited. It, it was an honor to, to win this role, and it's probably going to be pushed back quite a few months until, uh, you know, the world stabilizes a little bit more. Right. But, um, yeah, no, it's going to be a really fun gig. And my yep. first full-time job, though only for three months. Okay, only only full-time job I've ever wanted. I'll say that. There you and, go. And you're being very humble here. There were hundreds of people who applied for this, including 40 states and 30 countries. And so you were chosen out of all of these people to represent your local neighborhood and to show um, 
you know, some reporting efforts of stories and people and businesses in the lower Manhattan and how they recover from this, I think is going to be a showing through that challenge will be really important because, you know, outside of the United States, people know only a few places, right? You can't say, Oh yeah, have you been to Minnesota or Kansas? They wouldn't really understand that, but they definitely know New York city. And it'll be really interesting to show that perspective, I think. Yeah, you know, it's it's a totally insane honor, honestly, to have been chosen for this gig. And um, yeah, I think that the context of it has changed quite a bit. And the reason why they chose me has been, you know, at first it was very much like wanting just an influencer to show the good times of New York. Uh, and then the pandemic struck and uh, everything else that's been happening lately um, with the Black Lives Matter movement and whatnot. It just, it's, it's brought a whole different tone uh, to this to this job and it's gonna be more about uh, being an honest storyteller and um, you know balancing out the severity of these situations with uh, you know jubilant fun moments on the side too and um, they said you know that's why they chose me um, and how you know the job has changed a lot like they, they never expected um, it's also just an honor to be um, you know, uh, giving this unprecedented access to everything I wanted to, to shoot in Lower Manhattan, whether it be businesses or sanitation departments or uh, underground subway tunnels, like it's just going to be, um, yeah, uh, legitimacy and access that I've always hoped for. It seems uh, like a dream for a street photographer, right? Like you're it's, instead of having to hide and break it or not break in, but sneak us into places and do kind of behind the scenes. You're, you're in the forefront. You're invited to these locations to do this now. Yeah. It's going to be a really cool thing. And, and the access is going to be unprecedented. So I'm very excited. And one of the reasons they chose you is because one of your most recent projects, which is not YouTube related, but is Josh Katz related, which is the rooftop project. And I think one of my favorite videos recently that you posted, and it goes back to some of the things that you've been saying during the entire conversation we've had is you have very good morals right and you want to make sure that other photographers who are learning from you come out with those morals and that that code of ethics i think maybe that's the right way to say it right you have this code of ethics from the photography standpoint and that then directly translated to your rooftop project because you don't want people just to go take a picture of someone you want it to do it in a respectful and honorable way and you've done a great job of that I'm sorry, can I correct you? I, I pretend to have good morals. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're very good at pretending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, so I've, I've been, just a little back story here, I've been uh, working on this rooftop quarantine project. Uh, as we've all been stuck at home, uh, I knew that there'd be a vibrant scene on the roofs uh, from day one, and it was really awesome to watch develop and try to approach from, like, a really empathetic, like, uh, community-driven um, positive light and like, yeah. Uh, so the video you're talking about was just uh, talking about creating a code of ethics that would make my neighbors feel comfortable uh, being a part of this project and not feel like they're being invaded on or being spied on or you know, voyeuristic photographer classic uh, classic stereotypes there. And um, yeah, you know, it's um, it was definitely a challenge. It was definitely like a different type of uh, photography that I'm used to. Um, it felt like a derivative of street photography where the stakes were a lot higher. And um, yeah, you know, I, it's always fun to think about how best to approach these projects. And um, yeah, this one was quite different. It was interesting how it was interesting how you made the point too. I really liked listening to you talk about the process of making it and asking for consent because you made the point that the rooftop is a public space, but especially considering the proximity to a person's home, especially considering the, the time with quarantine going on, it's also a very personal and private space. I appreciated how you brought in the ethical aspect of that, of getting their consent, despite the fact that you could say, it's a public space, you're out, you're out in public, but you going to that extra length says something about your creation process and your mentality too. What inspired that sort of approach to it? Was there, was there a person that you looked up to that, taught you those lessons? Did you have an experience of your own that maybe turned you off of just being the aggressive street photographer, not asking for consent? What made you have this ethical approach to it? Um, it was just about talking to my neighbors and feeling out what, what made them feel okay and what made them feel not okay. And like, look, 
if you give anyone permission, can I photograph you at any point, and you're never going to expect it or, or even know it happened necessarily, most people would say, no, nah, nah, I'm not, why would I give you that access? Um, and, you know, street photography in and of itself is, um, can be disrespectful and can be invasive and, and tough and, and, and make people feel uncomfortable. And I, I think that it's okay uh, at times. Uh, I think that you have to approach it with the right attitude of like, you can still be invasive, get respectful. Um, you can still be like transparent, um, but you know, take the shot first and then do the talking. I, I do really advocate for like just communication in your street photography. But at the end of the day, like if you're gonna you know give a slight like if you're gonna push the line of invasiveness for a, a single fleeting moment of a stranger, that's okay. But uh, if you're doing this with people that you're gonna see over and over again, who you're gonna see on the streets when you're going out for for you know groceries and stuff, mm-hmm. um, then it becomes a community affair. And uh, I something that has to be navigated with like the utmost um, respect and, and just being really delicate about the whole thing. So yeah, a lot of conversations with the neighbors and um, just figuring out what would make people feel good about it. What, what was the roof culture before COVID? Was it, was there, were people still up there hanging out and you happened to notice this before or was like, Hey, I'm going to go to my roof because I can't be in my apartment anymore. <laughs> and then you notice people out there. What, how did that transpire? Yeah, I mean, roof hangs have always been a thing. Um, but every once in a while, you know, they're, they're a rare thing. And you go up there and you might not see a soul across, you know, I, I can see because most of the buildings in Brooklyn and my neighborhood are, are a comparable height. You know, I can see layers and layers of different rooftops. And yeah, you might not see a soul up there. But, uh, you know, as soon as COVID struck, um, and, and we are all quarantined, like New York being a place where no one has cars and just walking outside of your own apartment feels like, uh, a, a toxic war zone of, of, of germs, if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, the rooftop became the respite and it was a really neat, I knew it'd be a neat, beautiful thing. Um, just cause we had the ability to socialize with new people, our neighbors and, it, um, that um, while still being respectful of social distancing. So I knew that it'd be an exciting thing for a lot of people. I, I knew that some community would form out of it. And um, that's all I really knew. I just, and everything else was just like, well, let's see what happens. And um, yeah, it was, it was quite wild for, for a few months of um, yeah. Uh, yeah. the things that I saw people do up there uh, blew my mind, I will say that. <laughs> so on the... On the tail end of that, aside from getting a job opportunity, aside from developing this sort of ethical code, what did you take away from the project? Hmm. Uh, I think I took away that I really love doing these like long form, hunkered down, um, deliberative projects that, uh, yeah, I haven't made too many like formal series before. And this one was like, I tried to approach it not just from a creative perspective, but also from like a uh, urban anthropological perspective, mm-hmm. which I really enjoyed doing. Um, and yeah, maybe it's nice to accompany my work with some writing and um, just to slow it down and be more contemplative. And um, yeah. It yeah, seems like great. you're in the right place to do that all the time. I mean, you, you're in you're in a location where you could find, other, like you got Central Park, you can go do some kind of, you know, imagery there or or series there i mean you could do it in uh, now on the streets now when the streets are open you could do the same thing it's it you're in the right place to do that it's pretty awesome that 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 kind of the world works like that right you come up with this idea but you're in the mecca for it it's awesome for you yeah you know if you're not making good work in new york it's your own damn fault (laughs) that's that's very true so do you feel like you've been transitioning away from youtube and, or do you really see yourself coming up with a significant amount of content on the photography side going forward? Or will this take, will this opportunity take away from your YouTube? No, I mean, this opportunity is actually gonna drive up my YouTube creation. I think that I'll have a team of people behind me helping uh, edit and, and make, make more work. Um, and I'll be working on their YouTube as well. Um, I, I don't know though. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I like to think I'm like pretty, um, platform neutral and like to just 
be uh, adept at, at, you know, responding to the changing media landscape. And like, you know, in the past few years, I put out a few courses behind paywalls on my website. And, I, you know, I worked with Udemy to make a course, um, which, which has been a completely different business model than I ever expected going down. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, I, I, um, at the end of the day, my, my main goals are just, uh, creative pursuits and, uh, challenging myself and, uh, also, you know, at the same time being, uh, minimizing responsibility, maximizing challenge and living a somewhat comfortable lifestyle. Not, not, not glamorously comfortable, but, you know, <laughs> I, anyway, uh, yeah, trying to do all those things and, you know, maybe YouTube will be a major player in there. Maybe it won't be. Uh, it's always hard to say. Sounds like you kind of have the idea of going with it wherever it takes you. And it seems like the world has taken you to a really nice place to follow. So why not continue that path? Yeah, I mean, I will say that as someone who's been doing YouTube for 14 or 15 years now, I've watched a lot of creators who have been very successful at some points just completely fall off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a bunch of uh, reasons for that. Sometimes it's just burnout, going too hard. Sometimes it's not going hard enough. Uh, but a really common one I've seen is just the inability to pivot. Um, you know, they, they, um, YouTube changes, the algorithm changes, and, and what thrives is not what they were making. And rather than trying to do something different, uh, they say, ah, oh, old YouTube was so good. And, and you guys, you know, you hear undertones of that uh, from, from the way I talk about it too, I'm sure. But like, I've also been making strides to, to, to pivot the content to, um, to meet this changing landscape. Um, and yeah, I think that you just have to be, to be a, a, an online creator, a content creator, uh, requires a certain um, flexibility and like, acknowledging that it's it's riding a crazy wave that could stop at any moment and not taking it for granted uh so i'm always just trying to to pivot and um and to um diversify and not be reliant on any single platform because you know if that platform ends what do you have and if you're an instagram influencer who only takes selfies um then you have nothing if you have a a, a, a very marketable skill and an ability to, you know, make films and whatnot, or whatever it might be, you remove the platform and, and you still have uh, viability for success. So just trying to figure that all out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And so what is uh, looking towards the future, right? Obviously goal accomplished by becoming the explorer. What, what else do you have? What's the future of your channel? I think you kind of answered that there, but you know, what other goals do you have for 2020? Where do you see yourself going? Um, is there anything that you want to share that that's exciting? Obviously, you've got probably a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, um, I'd say, let's see. Um, I want to make my first zine, probably, or book of some sort for uh, this quarantine project that I'm, I'm still yeah. flirting with right now. That may or may not happen. Uh, that's I a great find idea another long-term documentary photo project to work on. Uh, and I've got a few things that I'm kind of tinkering with right now that uh, may or may not pan out. Um, I, you know, producing this full-length skateboarding video that I've been working really hard on is, is also like a very major goal of mine. Um, and that's been really fun. And, you know, I, I've been in other people's skate videos. You know, Revive has put out um, two skate videos and I've, I've finished my part for the third one now. But like that's been someone else's creative vision that I'm contributing skateboarding for. This is now like you know writing the skits and um, the bits and and the art direction that makes this into a cohesive piece um, that I'm really excited about. Um, I want to shoot a lot more skateboarding photography. I just reinvested in like some nicer flashes, uh, speed lights, so that's going to be popping off very soon. And um, just spending more time outside, shooting, running around, and um, using photography as a tool to experience the world. You know, it's, it's not really always about the photos. Sometimes it's about, uh, you know, capturing momentum. And uh, the photography, you know, the, the camera just happens to be that tool to do so. Yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely. When that video drops, let us know, because uh, I, we'll, we'll definitely come if there's a 
premiere or something like that, we'd be we'd be happy to do that. Uh, anytime I can get Drew to come to my house, and we can go to New York. We're in. There we go. Um, but yeah, like that sounds awesome. I mean, I I really you can seeing your progression and then seeing you through the lens. It's it's really really an impressive thing, and I think you should be really proud of what you've accomplished. Right? There's so many people out there that can't break away from the corporate side and that they get stuck there and don't get to follow their passions. And it's so amazing to talk to so many people who get to follow their passions and make a living out of it. So congratulations to you on that. Yeah, I think the I think the rooftop thing is so cool. And it, it's so neat how that was just such an unforeseen circumstance and you capitalized on that. It's it's very cool. I'm, I'm eager to see what you do with the uh, with the project with Lower Manhattan. I yeah, appreciate that, guys. I hate I hate to put capitalizing on 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 that project though, and that's something I've, I've been very hesitant to uh, to do because you know I don't want to I don't want to capitalize off of the neighbors. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's a delicate balance to be pursuing a project that will also in, in, further your career, yet not uh, exploiting your neighbors who are just trying to live their lives. Um, yeah, it's a that, that is definitely the strange conundrum of street photography, and uh, um, yeah, I definitely had to turn down a lot of opportunities from people that from companies that really wanted to directly capitalize off the project, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's not how we're gonna do things. <laughs> I, I I really liked listening to you talk about keeping it important with your neighbors, like making sure you represent your neighbors so well, because for me as as a person looking at the photography, consuming the photography, it, it has a global appeal in a sense that I could relate to those people on the roof, you know, the, the, the actions that they were doing, the, the singing, dancing, doing yoga outside. I, I think you're representing your neighbors and showing them well, but they, they do have such a global appeal. And I think that's what was really neat about that project for me was it was, it was so local and intimate, but globally appealing at the same time hey well I, I really appreciate that guys thank you for the kind words yeah, yeah we appreciate your time today man yeah very much so it's been uh it's been awesome and we look forward to uh seeing you oh wait 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 we do have one thing that we wanted to bring up um so i don't know if everyone knows this about josh but we did find this out josh is a fan of other josh cats and uh and, and we just want to talk to you a little bit about that because we talked about that, <laughs> right? When we were doing research into this, um, we found that there are a couple other Josh cats also in New York City. And we found out that Josh is friends with them, which I think is awesome. So can you uh, elaborate? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, sure. Um, on the I, I, look, you will never have a deeper connection with zero uh, you've never been more connected with a complete stranger than with someone who has the same name as you, particularly if it's such a common name. So like uh, my, me being a Josh Katz with a relatively high SEO on the name, uh, I get emails all the time directed toward two of the other prominent <laughs> Josh Katzes. Uh, and they get confused for me and, and it's credited to email correspondence. And then at one point I'm like, hey, Josh Katz, New York Times statistician, um, and, and journalist, uh, you want to get a beer sometime and uh, just talk about Josh Katz related matters. And <laughs> it was a really great time. And, and now that we've, uh, I've actually recently linked up with another Josh Katz, who is a, um, the other most prominent JK, I'd say, who is a, um, the lead singer of a, of, of a punk band. And he's really rad. <laughs> so yeah, I think the, the three of us awesome. currently have uh, tentative plans to meet up once this pandemic uh passes through uh you know to really have it up maybe we'll even call it a um a josh cat's gathering a uh an assembly if you will assembly. <laughs> assemble the cats <laughs> yeah i highly encourage everyone to reach out to people with the same name as you they, they tend to be quite friendly yeah it's, <laughs> i think it's awesome I, i'm gonna look for some more michael weinsteins of the world but uh, I, I thought that was a really fun thing that we talked about, and I wanted to make sure we brought it up. So, um, hey, Josh, uh, appreciate your time. And make sure you're, all of our listeners know that uh, they can follow you on YouTube for photography tutorials or some great videos of you skateboarding in the past, present, and future. 
Um, as well as check out his Instagram and check out the Rooftop Project and watch him grow into this new Explorer role in Manhattan. We uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, wish you the best. Thanks, Josh. Awesome. Mike Drew, thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it, man.